This algebraic geometry video will be about automorphisms of affine and projective space. So we've defined a category of algebraic varieties or algebraic, closed algebraic sets. And an obvious question is, um, what is the group of automorphisms of an algebraic set? Um, in general, the group of automorphisms of some algebraic set is almost always the trivial group, that most, most algebraic varieties don't have any interesting automorphisms at all. They're, they're just very ugly and complicated. Um, however, affine space and projective space are very symmetrical and have lots of automorphisms. So let's first of all look at automorphisms of affine space. A n. And of course, we should first do the case of one dimensional affine space. Well, one dimensional affine space is really easy because we know its coordinate ring is just k of x. So morphisms from a1 to a1 just correspond to homomorphisms of algebras from k of x to k of x. And it's obvious what these are. These just take x to a polynomial p of x. So morphisms from a1 to itself are just the same as polynomials with coefficients in k. And we want to ask which of these are invertible. Well, again, that's pretty obvious. It's invertible if p of x is equal to ax plus b with a non-zero. Um, sort of completely easy to check that these things have inverses and nothing else does. So the group of automorphisms of one dimensional affine space is just the so-called, um, well, this group is sometimes called the AX plus B group for fairly obvious reasons. You can identify it with the set of two by two matrices of the form AB01. Um, and it's, um, fairly easy structure as a group. It's non-commutative, as you can easily check. It's got a normal subgroup um, consisting of the elements of the form 1, 1, B, 0, which is isomorphic to the additive group of K, and the quotient is isomorphic to the multiplicative group of K. Um, this group is a counterexample to quite a lot of things. Um, for example, over the real numbers, this is the simplest example of a group where the left Haar measure is not the same as a right Haar measure. But anyway, um, there's really not much else to say about it. Um, so what about a2. So here we have the automorphisms of polynomials and two variables. And by analogy, there are some pretty obvious automorphisms. You can map kx1, sorry, kxy to, um, well, we can map x to a x plus b y plus c and y to d x plus e y plus f where a d b sorry where a b d e has determinant non-zero so this would be the the analog of um, what happens for affine space and this certainly does give you a group of automorphisms of affine space. However, the full group is much bigger. So what other automorphisms can you get? Um, well, for example, we can have the following automorphism. We map x to x, not terribly exciting, and we map y to y plus any polynomial in x. And this obviously has an inverse where we map x to x and y to y minus this polynomial in x. So we have an infinite dimensional abelian subgroup. 
So it's a very large infinite dimensional group of automorphisms. Um, and of course, you can do lots of other things. Instead of fixing X, we could fix Y or some other linear polynomial in X. And then we could start composing these. So the, the, the automorphism group is, is, is getting pretty hairy. Um, well, what else can you say about it? Suppose you've got an automorphism um, of affine space where we map all the Xi to Fi here, I'm taking affine space to fi of x1 up to xn. So in general, an endomorphism of affine space will be given by n polynomials in n variables. And the question is, when is this an automorphism? So when is f1 up to fn an automorphism of a n? Well, there's an obvious necessary condition we can look at the Jacobian, um, which you remember is this matrix of elements delta Fi over delta Xj, and we can take the determinant of this. Now the Jacobian of Fg is equal to the Jacobian of F times the Jacobian of G. So if Fg equals one, then the Jacobian of F is invertible. Um, as a matrix with, with entries and polynomials. <clears throat> and so it's reasonably natural to conjecture that um, this is an automorphism of affine space if and only if the Jacobian is invertible. So, so one implication is pretty trivial. The other one is the Jacobian conjecture. Which the Jacobian conjecture says that if the Jacobian is um, invertible, this implies F is an automorphism. It's still an unsolved problem as far as I know. It's one of the most notorious unsolved problems in mathematics because of the large number of incorrect published solutions of it. In fact, I think there's one mathematician who managed to publish three different solutions of this, all of which were wrong. Um, so it's really notorious for having subtle pitfalls that people fall into. Okay, well, that's done morphisms of affine space, morphisms of the affine line are easy and morphisms of affine space in high dimensions are a real headache to deal with. Now let's look at morphisms of projective space. Um, as before, we should start off by looking at the case of um, endomorphisms of P1 or automorphisms of P1. Well, if we've got a map from P1 to P1, then um, um, we can look at the inverse image. So, sorry, um, let me try again. Um, we get a map. We can restrict this to a map from A1 to P1. And we get a map from an open subset of A1 to A1, which is contained in P1, because P1 is just equal to A1. So let's, let's make it A1 together with a point at infinity. So we've got a map from an open subset of A1 to itself. This open subset might possibly be empty if A1 is just mapped to the point at infinity, but let's not worry about that. Now, this means we've just got a regular map on an open subset of A1, and this is just given by a rational function. Um, Px over Q of x. So, um, and, and conversely, if you're given a rational function, um, giving a map from an open subset of A1 to P1, then this will can be extended to a map from P1 to P1. Um, so, um, this gives us all the um, 
morphisms from P1 to itself. And now we want to figure out which of these have inverses. And this isn't too difficult to figure out. They have inverses if they're of the form Ax plus B over Cx plus D, where A, B, C, D has determinant that's non-zero. Um, in fact, if you represent this rational map here by a little two by two matrix, you can see that composition of rational maps actually corresponds to multiplication of matrices by a fairly easy calculation that I will omit. So this almost gives us the group of automorphisms of the projective line. And we have the group GL2 of the field K, which are the matrices A, B, C, D, with determinant not equal to zero. However, this isn't quite the full group of automorphisms because the diagonal matrices A of the form A, A, all act as the trivial um, automorphism. We're taking X to AX over A, which is obviously just equal to X. So we should quotient out by this. Um, the quotient is called the projective general linear group um, because it's the group of automorphisms of projective space. And it's just the general linear group of a field quotiented out by the diagonal matrices of the form A, naught, naught, A. Um, so this group will have dimension four. And this group here is dimension one. So altogether, we get a three-dimensional group of, end of automorphisms of um, the um, projective space. We notice that this contains the AX plus B group as a subgroup. If, if we just take all the matrices with C equals naught and D equals one, then we get the group of automorphisms of the affine line being a subgroup of the group of automorphisms of projective space. Um, so what we see is that um, this is actually the same as what you get in complex analysis. If you remember the Riemann sphere in complex analysis as a group of automorphisms, which are maybe uh, the fractional linear transformations. And it, we find that the group of automorphisms of the projective line is the same as the group of automorphisms of the um, Riemann sphere. However, in the affine case, um, the group of um, uh, so, sorry, uh, let me just try again. What has, so what I meant to say is the endomorphisms of the projective line are the same as um, endomorphisms of the Riemann sphere. That's complex analytic maps from the Riemann sphere to itself. However, for the affine line, the group of endomorphisms from the affine line are fairly restricted. They just consist of polynomials, whereas the group of um, endomorphisms of the complex plane in complex analysis is much bigger. That consists of all entire functions, which are um, that there are lots of entire functions that aren't polynomials. So in other words, we see um, that for project the projective line, um, algebraic geometry is very similar to doing things analytically, whereas for the affine line, there are far more endomorphisms if you allow analytic functions than if you allow algebraic functions. So this is a very special case of a paper by Serre um, called um, Analytic Geometry and Algebraic Geometry, except the title was in French. It says, roughly speaking, that um, if you're projective manifolds are, if you're working with projective manifolds, then analytic maps tend to be algebraic. Whereas if you're working with affine manifolds, then analytic things are much more common than algebraic things and quite often not algebraic. 
Um, we should have one more example involving um, morphisms of the affine plane. Here we have an endomorphism of the affine plane to itself, which takes x, y to x, x, y. And we can ask, what is the image? Well, this isn't very difficult to work out. Um, the image um, just consists of everything with x non-zero. So we get everything here and everything here. If x is zero, then this coordinate is zero, but this coordinate also has to be zero. So we also get the origin, but we don't get the rest of the y-axis. And the point of this example is the image can be quite complicated. The image is not open, it's not closed, it's not even locally closed. So there are no particularly easy statements you can make about what the image of a map of a closed set is under a, a, a morphism. Um, there's a theorem of Chevalet saying that it always has to be a constructible set, which means it can be constructed from open and closed sets by taking unions and intersections and complements. But in general, there's no easier sort of um, type of set that the image of a closed set is. Um, on the other hand, we will see that for projective manifolds, the image of a closed set is always closed. Okay, so the next lecture will be on the Axe-Grothendieck theorem.